Pong is widely considered to be the world's first video game. The story is unparalleled, the voice acting is top notch, the gameplay is everything you could ask for in a 2020 video game. But can you beat Pong without moving? To start, let's first discuss what qualifies as movement in Pong. It's up or down you fucking idiot, what else did you think it would be? For personal reasons, and as to not violate any restraining orders, I ended up choosing Pong, the next level, for the Game Boy Color as the version of Pong I would play. I didn't want to play it in a browser. Pong's not a complicated game, but something about virtually playing it on an emulated version of the game's console felt more authentic than playing it in a web browser. Also because, finding a way to play the arcade version of Pong in an emulator was far more convoluted than I expected it to be. Crack your knuckles and give your mustache a twirl, because we're in. Before doing anything else, I had to stretch. You always want to make sure you work your legs a bit before hunkering down for a flight. Not that I would know anything about that. The last time I was on a plane was when I went to Disney World in 2005, and that was only like a 3 hour flight. With all the formalities out of the way, I could begin the challenge of beating Pong without moving. In case you either didn't know or lacked the higher brain functionality to be able to put it together on your own, the mechanics of Pong are not very difficult. Where the ball hits the paddle determines where the ball goes. If it's closer to the center, it's effectively straight across the field. If it's towards the edge, it'll be at a more extreme angle. That's about it. In this version of Pong, you need 11 points to win. Going in, I expected this to be a colossal time sink. I thought it would be a numbers game, unrelated to the scores required to win. Call me a cheater if you want, but I sped up the game using an emulator for this exact reason. Difficulty is non-existent. The question wasn't supposed to be whether it can be done, rather it was how long it would take. There are a couple problems worth pointing out. The first is the likelihood that the ball hits my paddle at all upon being served. It was not at all uncommon for the ball to miss my paddle for 8 or 9 of the 11 servings in the match. So, statistically, it doesn't look good. Let's say it hits my paddle 8 out of 11 times. That's a 27% chance to bounce the ball back. Even if that guaranteed victory, it would have to happen 11 times total. There can only be 21 servings in a game. 52%, 11 out of 21, of those must hit my paddle, but you know what, this doesn't even matter. You wanna know why? Here's why. I spent 50 minutes playing Classic Pong. With the fast forwarding enabled, you're looking at, at most, 10 seconds per match. Add another second to restart, and you're at about 11 seconds per match. Over the course of 50 minutes, I played, spectated I guess, at least 270 games. Not once did I ever score a single point in Classic Pong. And very, very rarely did I hit the ball back twice in one volley. It's not up to me. It's up to the computer and where they hit the ball with their paddle. But here's the thing about that. They're programmed to automatically go towards the ball. And because you're not moving, there's a limit to how far up or down the ball goes. It will never bounce off your paddle at such an extreme angle that the computer paddle can't hit it back. It's just impossible for the ball to not be hit back. And if the opponent never misses, it wouldn't even matter if my stationary paddle could hit it back. Best case scenario, you're stuck in an infinite loop where nobody misses the ball, so nobody can ever score a point. I felt defeated the last time I did this much nothing, I was in high school. I may not have turned in any Algebra 2 assignments or answered any of the questions on a quiz, but I sure as shit beat Pokemon Blue by the time that year was over. I then moved on to Jungle Pong, thinking I might catch a break. Things got interesting here. I actually managed to get some points, but this is not Pong. This is some sick fuck's idea of a good time like a block of cheese that's been sealed in a jar for 15 years, this is something that was never supposed to exist. Soccer Pong is another monstrosity. It's just wrong. There are four paddles and you control two at the same time. Even I have my limits. I went back to regular Pong to cleanse my palate after that. And there I sat, stewing in my own madness for another 20 minutes. I'd modified the controls a bit, so I didn't even have to hold down the fast forward button anymore. The game almost plays itself, I just have to press A every 12 seconds or so to start a new game. I would love to tell you that something worth mentioning happened during those 20 minutes, but that would be a lie, and I've never lied in my life. I never scored a point, I never even came close. I never even had the slightest bit of confidence that I would ever get a point. 
I think by this point, with all the nothing you've seen, you understand why this is a completely hopeless endeavor. But if I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna add some flair. If I'm gonna fall out of a plane without a parachute, I'm gonna chug a gallon of food coloring so my splattered corpse looks like a fucking rainbow. There was one last option I hadn't looked at. I didn't even want to entertain the idea of Arctic Pong until I was prepared for it. Mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, virtually, hypothetically, all of it. The time had come, I had to see the face of God for myself. My fingers trembled as I navigated towards option number three. Just, just look at it. Take it all in. The penguins. It makes me want to cry just thinking about it. It was truly magnificent. It was everything I hoped it would be. Noah figured this out decades ago. That penguins are the key to it all. They make or break this challenge. I think you knew that when you saw this video's title. That it would all come down to penguins. It's hard to critique perfection, but I'll give it a shot. The problem here is that, in theory, it would be possible to win this winter wonderland of Pong. There are power-ups that change things up and revolutionize the Call of Duty series in ways we've never seen before in Call of Duty. Forget what we said in last year's trailer. This is the most innovative Call of Duty ever forever. The only power-up, ability, whatever, that matters is the one that doubles the ball. The computer AI can't keep up or split itself in half, so that power-up is basically a sometimes automatic point for you. Sometimes you get a point from it, sometimes you don't. The issue is that, from what I saw, you can only get that once per match. It won't appear more than that. You can also get the ability that lets you hit the ball at an extreme angle. Then it can bounce off a penguin that's already at an extreme angle, to go so far beyond 45 degrees that reality itself starts to collapse in on itself around the ball and you get a point. But again, that only seems to happen once per match. I scored points somewhat consistently, points in this instance meaning the total collection of my point earned throughout all games played, but it never went beyond a single point in a single game. I tried everything I could think of, I played every possible variation of Pong in this game that God forgot, but I could not beat Pong without moving. If you enjoyed the video, learned anything, or just liked seeing the penguins, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for helping make videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server if you'd like to get a glimpse at what hell looks like. I have a Twitter and I say things there sometimes. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day. The setup for this video is pretty much irrelevant. All I did was create a character to make sure my luck was at 1, acquire as many caps as I could, by selling the items I started with and whatever I stole from Doc Mitchell, murdered an NCR trooper for their armor, and entered the strip via Camp McCarran. I somewhat recently started using luck in my New Vegas challenges to easily acquire thousands of caps to spend on supplies like weapons, armor, and ammo. Now luck of something like 5 or 6 will give you decent odds of winning, luck of 7 or 8 will be like having a dead rabbit with all four feet in your wallet, and with luck of 9 or 10, you'll have to go out of your way to lose. But what about luck of one? Can you get kicked out of a casino and follow New Vegas with only one luck? Let me start off by saying that this video took on a life of its own fairly quickly. It's one of the few times an idea has gotten away from me and evolved into something else that I didn't anticipate. But something popped into my head and I ran with it. I'll get there in a minute. My first stop on the strip was any of the casinos. According to someone on the internet, all casinos have the same odds of winning, which is good. I wanted the worst odds possible, and I didn't have to put any effort into making that happen. So I went to the tops and noticed that if you have no weapons, you can tell the receptionist that you aren't carrying any weapons. I never knew that was an option. There are three games you can play, blackjack, roulette, and slots. From my experience playing blackjack every day at lunch in 7th grade with my friends, one of whom played and was the dealer at the same time, and always seemed to win for reasons that none of us understood at the time, Blackjack is the only game that has some skill involved. Knowing when you should stand or take another card, the problem is that with luck at one, strategy and skill pretty much go out the window. At first I was surprised, I actually managed to win a few hands, then things took a turn for the worst, and I lost 2800 caps in about 5 minutes and you can't abuse quick saves to cheat the system. Obsidian thought of that and added a 60 second cooldown period inside the casinos when you load a quick save. 
It was abundantly clear that Blackjack was a dead end. If you get a 4, a queen, and an ace, obviously you're gonna hit again. Then you get another queen, and you lose. That's pretty much how every hand went. You can also see the you feel lucky appear on the top right corner of the screen. It happens a lot, actually. Now you might be thinking that I'm playing like a moron, and maybe you're right. I always hit or stayed. I never surrendered because I'm not a little bitch, so Blackjack is worthless. I tried the slots next. This is where I really expected to win it big. I don't know a lot about slot machines, but what I do know is that when you win, you win, and when you lose, you lose. Also, the set game time multiplier command doesn't work with slot machines. Rather than explaining how luck applies here, I'll just read off the Fallout wiki because it explains it rather well. With a luck of 10, slot machines may be an effective and simple way to break the bank at a casino. Even blackjack requires a modicum of sense, so one is not constantly doubling down on a hand of 20. But with slot machines, the expected return with each pull of the lever is extremely positive. With a bit of starting cash to wait out a few dry spells, even constant plays of a low bid, like the max 25 chips allowed at the Sierra Madre Casino, will shortly yield a casino ban. So instead of having to remember when to hit or stay, you can just sit back, turn off the brain, take in the sounds, and rake in chips. Now with all of that being said, you can probably understand how luck of one would not be ideal when playing the slots. Trust me, I thought the same thing. My idea was to speed up the game and spam the W key to keep betting. I assumed that with enough time, the inevitable jackpots would outweigh the caps spent on the one-armed bandit box. But as I said, the SGTM command doesn't work. However, that was horribly timed. However, through the power of modern medicine, we can brute force the bitch into submission and force her to spit out every last chip she's got. How is this done? Simple. I downloaded a program that automated button presses. You start a recording, hit the keys you want to automatically press, stop the recording, and start back the playback, at which time the automation takes over. With this program, I successfully automated gambling in Fallout New Vegas, which might be close to the title of the video. I'm not sure how clickbaity I want to get with it yet. I let it run with a bet of 5 for quite some time. With 2700 caps, betting in increments of 5, and the inability to lose more than 5 chips at a time, that's more than 500 pulls at the slot machine. After probably 10 minutes, I cranked it up to 10 caps per bet and let it ride for a while. In this first segment, it ran for 18, maybe 19 minutes. Each pull takes about 5 seconds, so that's roughly 225 bets with this particular machine. Now I want to point out that it wasn't a loss every single time. I did win on occasion, but the wins, because of how my luck was, wasn't enough to offset the cost of betting in the first place. So with that failure, there was only one thing left to do. A surefire way to break the bank. Give myself 10 million chips, max out the bet, and let the bitch run until something happens. And this time I really do mean I let it run. None of this, it went on for 15 whole minutes bullshit. I'm talking about almost two hours of nothing but slots. I'm not gonna talk about every small victory, but I did skim through this to see what jackpots I got. At around the 8 minute mark, I won 375 chips from my 75 chip bet. 14 minutes in, I won 150 chips back to back. That might sound impressive, but it's the two smallest wins possible based on the number of chips I bet. I would love nothing more than to tell you about all the jackpots I got, the tens of thousands of caps I won, but things just didn't go my way. I won 375 chips a handful of times, maybe 10 times in total over the course of the two whole hours, but I never got anything higher than that. By the time those two hours were up, I'd gambled away 53,000 chips. I never came close to winning. Obviously, I took my frustrations out on the other gamblers. To round off my experience at this establishment, I went back in time before there were a bunch of dead bodies all over the place and tried roulette. Roulette was probably the most annoying of the three games. It takes the raw luck of the slots and combines it with the effort required to play blackjack. You can bet anywhere on the board. The less likely you are to win, the higher the payout if you do win. And you can bet on multiple spaces, but if you do, the current bet resets down to zero so you've got to manually increase the bet every single time. 
It's too time consuming for me. It takes too long to sit and play for it to be worth it. I went with my gut and stuck to the spaces with the lowest payout, because they are the most likely to win. I won more frequently than I did at the other games, but just like them, I didn't win often enough to come out on top. So. To finally answer the video title's question, I don't think you can get kicked out of a casino in Fallout New Vegas with only one luck. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for making videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server through a link in the video description. Follow me on Twitter at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day. There are a lot of ways to make Fallout New Vegas more difficult. You could make it so you die from taking any damage. You could force yourself to use horrible weapons. You could even only move backwards to get around the world. But what if you wanted to use what the developers intended to make it more difficult? Can you beat Fallout New Vegas' hardcore mode without eating, sleeping, or drinking? First, some housekeeping. Anytime I start a new playthrough in New Vegas, I'll get the opening shots for my beginning of the playthrough spiel, then I'll reload a save I made early last year. I do this because of one of the mods I use, Project Nevada, which you can think of as a base level mod that has things hundreds and thousands of other mods use and require. This mod allows you to change a bunch of different settings, spawn rates for ammo, your hit points based on your endurance skill, your run speed when a weapon is equipped, almost anything, but I prefer the default New Vegas settings. So rather than resetting everything manually every single time, I load an old save, use a console command to change my name and the way my character looks, and go on as if nothing happened. That's why I don't put too much time or effort into the way my characters look. That's it. The curtain is closed. Back to the game. I went all in on what you'd expect me to for special stats. Luck is high, because I can hear the roulette table calling me from here. Charisma is a dump stat as always, and the rest are just there. Skills are speech, repair, and medicine. Traits are skilled to boost all stats, and trigger discipline to make gunshots more likely to not miss. Right now, time is of the essence. In hardcore mode, you must keep track of your drinking, eating, and sleeping if you want to survive. It's a fairly basic system. There's a tracker in your pit boy, just like you'd see for radiation. Once any of the four, radiation, sleep, hydration, or food, reach 1000, you die. Radiation isn't really an issue in this run, but it's still there. Sleep increases by one point every 50 seconds. Food increases twice as fast, at one point every 25 seconds. Then there's hydration, that increases by one point every 10 seconds. Now what does that mean? It means that because I cannot sleep or consume liquid sustenance in game, I only have 10,000 seconds of playtime to beat Fall of New Vegas or else I die. That's 166 minutes, or 2 hours and 46 minutes to beat the game. That's not a lot of time. Thankfully, as anyone who dreads human interaction will be able to tell you, time itself seems to slow down when you're trying to think of a way to respond after someone says something. So those 10,000 seconds don't include dialogue or time spent in your pit boy I dropped the Vault 13 canteen, and my first stop in this race against the clock was Cazador Canyon to discover the Great Cons early. That was a mistake, a boo-boo if you will, because there's no reason why I had to do this now. I could have easily fast traveled to Good Springs after I got myself a bunch of weapons and stim packs and made the journey wrapped in the safety of my own arms. Cazadors stung me a couple times, I reloaded a quick save after most of them, any damage has the potential to be a problem. I also got a surprise hug from a Deathclaw. It managed to swipe my ass a few times as I expertly bobbed and weaved around the rocks while passing through a viper camp who would distract themselves from me with the monster. That worked out for the most part. The Deathclaw either got bored or died, but the vipers kept coming after me and I could tell from their scent that they had good weapons on them. Problem was, they were viper leaders and they had solid armor like combat armor or metal armor. My best ranged weapon was only a 10mm pistol. I had a grenade launcher too, but I wanted to conserve as much ammo as I could. Eventually, I managed to decide that killing them was a waste of time, so I sidestepped out of their line of sight, leveled up, you know what I put the skill points into, entered the Canyon of the Red Rock, spoke to nobody, and knew that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity to kill people with visibly powerful guns. My throwing spears were broken and wouldn't fly, stupid fucking game. Good news is, I never leave someone else's home without a blade. My master would never forgive me if I left unarmed. 
I took more time than I should have, killing a couple different great cons. I used sneak attacks on them all. I couldn't risk alerting the others of my actions against the only family they'd ever known. With a sniper rifle that I had no bullets for, and the world's fastest firing gun with an AEK and 972 in its name, I returned to Good Springs, bartered briefly with Chet, and began heading for the Strip. I really wanted to stop by Frankie's guns and ammo, but it's a mod location, and killing those within for their weapons felt like cheating for some reason. I killed a few powder gangers littering the road leading northeast towards the Strip, also ended a bunch of puppies hiding out in an overturned semi-truck, and arrived in Sloan like a virus arrives in a new country. Snuffle's leg got the elite treatment option because he played basketball and therefore was far more deserving of my medical treatment than any of the ordinary peasants in the area. That was actually one of the Ten Commandments. In times of turmoil, protect the celebrities. Their lives are worth more than your own. Because Lady Luck was disgusted by my performance as of late, I could not kill Snuffles and the few Cory Junction workers without taking very much damage. The experience their bodies offered wasn't worth the hits I'd take or the ammo spent on them. Outside Cory Junction, I immediately discovered Bunker Hill and reveled in the rare opportunity to kill an entire family's worth of Bark Scorpion, which rewarded a nice 9 XP per kill. I wasn't going to work with the Brotherhood at all. Their quest line is too long. Being stripped naked and told to go deal with an NCR soldier eats up valuable time. There's some time to kill as I head towards this trip. My primary concern going into this run wasn't time. Speedrunners have beaten New Vegas without any glitches or exploits in under 30 minutes. Even without any specific speedrun strategy, New Vegas can be beaten in under two and a half hours if you know what you're doing. My concern was what effects the lack of food, water, and sleep would have on my stats. Speech is what I was concerned about specifically. If you consume no water, you'll see decreases in your endurance, perception, and intelligence as the thirst level increases. The bigger that level, the worse the effects. A lack of sleep will hit agility, intelligence, and endurance. A lack of food though, that lowers strength, perception, and charisma, and that's bad. Charisma gives bonuses to barter and speech, the only two skills that can be used to beat New Vegas without shedding any blood or making the vault shed cry. But I planned ahead, or I got lucky that doing no research of any kind worked to my advantage. The lowest a special stat can be is 1. For every point in charisma, barter and speech are raised by 2. The opposite is true as well. If you're suffering from some effect that lowers charisma, barter and speech will be lowered by 2. However, if your charisma is already at 1, there's nowhere for it to go. Which means, the only thing I thought might cause problems is now a non-issue. By this point, I will have witnessed an encounter between the NCR and Fiends, killed an NCR trooper for their outfit, and entered the Strip via Camp McCarran. As always, I went straight for the tops to murder Benny. It was a little tough, sorta. Tough in the sense that I made a difficult decision. I really wanted to use the grenade launcher to take out everyone. It was more than powerful enough for it but doing so would put my limbs at risk. My toenails are too precious to me for me to put them on the line. With Benny, the chairman, and almost everyone else in the casino area dead and beginning to rot, I wasted a small amount of time by meeting Yes Man. Siding with Yes Man is the quickest way to beat the game, but if speed is what you're after, it makes no sense to meet with him now. You need to get the platinum chip from Benny and remove Mr. House from Earth, before you can tell Yes Man to meet you at the Lucky 38. If you were to do the things in the proper order, you'd get the Platinum Chip, Kill House, and call for Yes Man. What I did was get the chip, meet Yes Man, Kill House, then return to Yes Man, an extra step if you will. In those wasted minutes, I began doing something odd, weird, something I don't remember doing before, using Maria as an actual gun. Then I stopped by Gamora to run amok in their casino. I required as many caps as I could fit in my secret hiding hole. At my peak, I had almost 5,000 caps ready to be fished out of the woman behind the counter. I would have kept going, but it kicked me out of the game and I couldn't find the guy who would offer me rewards for being so lucky. So I left, got my payment from Mr. House, watched in horror as valuable minutes were massacred and stepped on beneath Mr. House's massive ego. And with speech at 100, I entered the White Glove Society gathering house to mindlessly commit felonies. The AEK was phenomenal for maybe a second and a half. 
There's a reason I hadn't used it. Maria did an admirable job taking the lives of the cannibals inside the casino. One could even say that Maria killed them with an unparalleled level of style and grace. The perfect weapon for the woman who's purposely starving herself to death. A couple grenades were used to mop up the remaining white gloves inside the eating auditorium that I decided should die. Then, like a father looking for a new significant other because he doesn't love his wife or son anymore, I left to become a boomer. Just before setting off for their territory, I sold everything I didn't need to the gun runners and bought some supplies. I wasn't sure what it was I was after, what gun I wanted, but nothing piqued my interest, so I settled on more ammo for the guns I already had, and knew for a fact that the boomers would be licking my feet before this day is done. The boomers were as boring as the mints at the bottom of my grandmother's purse. I killed Melvin, stim-packed my way through their barrage, killed Pearl, killed a few others on my way out and was almost 40% of the way towards my own demise. I can't confirm this, but part of me thinks that the rate at which your thirst level increases gets higher the more thirsty you are. I'll come back to that in a bit. Almost all the pieces had been laid on the table, ready to be used to make a puzzle. After getting Veronica as a companion, I quickly got a few things repaired by Mr. Thirsty, and returned to Hidden Bunker to lose my way in the sandy darkness. Veronica got me inside. I met with Ramos, had done everything with the Brotherhood that I had to, dismissed Veronica, killed Ramos, stole his gun, and went back to the Strip. I took the route through Freeside instead of using the monorail at Camp McCarran again. This would likely save time in the long run, as I could fast travel directly to the Strip's north gate. Crippled after a fight inside the tops, I spoke to Yes Man again for some stupid fucking reason. Mr. House was still alive. There was no reason to talk to him yet. Frustrated at the amount of time I'd wasted backtracking through the tops with a broken leg and no way to fix it, I returned to Good Springs, hobbled along the one road leading through town, got a farewell gift from Doc Mitchell in the form of medical assistance that I overpaid for, and my thirst was already up to 600. To give some insight, it was at 370 at 9 minutes 12 seconds into this recording. After about 16 more minutes, it was at 600. Maybe I'm just not understanding this. Thirst increases by one point every 10 seconds. That's six points per minute. Assuming all 16 minutes are gameplay, no loading screens or dialogue or inventory management, that's a theoretical total of 96 points. 16 times nine is 96. How the hell did it go up 230 points in 16 minutes? I couldn't tell you, but after seeing how dramatically it increased, I became worried that I, like all of you watching this, will run out of time. I immediately returned to the Lucky 38, threw knives into Mr. House. Yes, I bought throwing knives specifically for Mr. House. Told Yes Man to join me, he violently spasmed himself into Mr. House's former living vessel, and I told him a certain someone could bite the dust. I'd say the actual words, but I'm a little concerned that saying something like that in these 2020 times would get me put on a government list. I hadn't gone anywhere near the El Dorito submarine sandwich shop yet. The closest location I'd found was 18A Trading Post. It was surprisingly dark and lonely in the hills southwest of the station. My only companions were dead grass and the plants I've learned to be cactuses of some extreme variety. The NCR were less than enthused by my arrival at the station. What I think made them really mad was when I started launching live grenades at them. They didn't worry for very long. The four inside woke up after I powered the Lucky 38. I'd planned on letting them live, but their mass awakening startled me. Being startled is a satisfactory reason to blow up a group of soldiers. And there's that government list again. With the stage set, all that remained was to travel to the Hoover Dam to finish the fight. I checked my hydration shortly after my arrival. 942 out of a thousand. It went up more than 300 points in less than 15 minutes. Time was not on my side, it would seem. Supplies were limited, morale was low, the dead bodies I'd made were disheartening to those I hadn't killed yet. Yes Man comforted me with a plan of attack. Destroy the generators. The lack of water in my body was beginning to show signs of wear and tear, primarily in the form of an annoying flashing red icon on my hood. Soon enough, I emerged outside the office, back atop the Hoover Dam. I paid no mind to the battles being waged on the dam itself. My life was almost over. Thirst was at 962. All those mad minutes I did last year have paid off big time. I knew for a fact that I had only moments before I would drop dead, ending the story of Hardcore Carol forever. But like I said, I knew that speech would be unaffected by my advanced dehydration. As long as I didn't accidentally agree to battle the legate to death, I could convince him to stand down 
talk General Oliver out of committing suicide by the courier, and I beat Fall on New Vegas' hardcore mode without eating, drinking, or sleeping. There is one last thing to attend to. Those of us who know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two know what's going on during the ending slideshow. There's a man behind the screen reading it. What I wanted to know is what happens if your thirst was at 999 right as you ended the game. Would it tick over to 1000 and kill you during the ending? No. What it does do though is break the game. Your character cuts off the narrator by clearing their throat, then he shuts up and never says another word. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for helping make videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server through a link in the video description. Follow me on Twitter, at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day. Maybe. Unlike Fallout 3 and 4, Fallout New Vegas has a reputation system that keeps track of how the factions like the NCR, Legion, and Great Cons feel about your character. Most people pick a faction to side with and do whatever's necessary to keep them happy. But what if them being happy wasn't enough? What if you wanted every faction to worship you like a god? Can you beat Fallout New Vegas while being idolized by everyone? There are more than a dozen factions in Fallout New Vegas, but only 11 of those matter for this challenge. Only 11 appear within the Reputation tab in your Pip-Boy. Each faction in this list has a range of emotions they can feel towards your character, all dependent on how you've acted towards them as a people, how you've treated the individuals in that community, have you stolen anything, have you helped those in need, have you eaten any dead people in broad daylight, do good, and you're awarded with fame, earn enough fame with a faction and they'll like you, then they'll accept you, push through the love stage, into worshipping territory and you'll become idolized. The amount of fame required to be idolized varies from faction to faction, but becoming a respected member of a community is not enough. On top of needing to amass positive reputation points with each faction, I have to not do anything to piss them off. Each faction will tolerate some amount of reckless behavior before they start letting the insults fly. Any amount of negative reputation points, infamy, is a death sentence. Killing a member of a faction and being caught for it is 30 infamy. Getting caught stealing is 2 infamy. Knowing anyone in the world sees me as anything less than perfect, my heart couldn't take it. You can't undo infamy. Those points don't go away. If you're idolized by Good Springs and get caught stealing a potato, the townspeople will never look at you the same way. You'll be a good-natured rascal forever. With that in mind, let's meet the factions. The Boomers require 50 positive reputation points, fame, to be idolized by them. The Brotherhood of Steel need 20 points. Caesar's Legion needs 100 points to be idolized. The Followers of the Apocalypse need 50 points. Freeside needs 70 points. Good Springs needs 15 points. The Great Cons need 30 points. The New California Republic requires 80 points. Novak needs 15 points. The Powder Gangers need 30 points. The Strip needs 40 points. Lastly, the White Gloves, the White Unholy Mittens themselves, need a heart-stopping 10 points to become idolized. As for special stats and, you know, the rest of the game, I went with a maxed out intellect for skill points, 9 in luck for critical shots and good fortune when gambling. Spread out the rest, picked Speech, Guns, and Lockpick as my skills, Skilled and Wild Wasteland as my traits, and introduced the Wasteland to its new best friend. Everything is up for grabs in this playthrough. Any exploits can be used. The only thing I can't do is use console commands. I began with Chet, as one does in a normal playthrough, and let the bullshit out of the pen by utilizing the first of many tricks I have stuffed up my sleeve. Dynamite is a special explosive. If you drop a stick on the ground, you can blow it up by shooting it, and if that dynamite happens to kill someone, the game has nobody to blame because the dynamite's gone, so your reputation suffers no consequences. A couple downsides, Dynamite doesn't play well with quicksaves. If I drop a couple sticks on the ground to take out a few guys, quicksave and the explosion doesn't kill them, reloading the quicksave eats my dynamite. Every time. Another downside to this exploit in general is that the explosion needs to kill everyone it touches. If an NPC takes damage, they'll know you did it and that gives you infamy. Good Springs is the first town to feel my loving wrath. Not a lot to this town. Do the tutorial quest with Sunny Smiles for 4 points. Cheyenne dying to a rogue Colonel Autumn didn't harm me at all. Fix Trudy's radio for 2 more points, and a fork in the road appears. The Powder Gangers and Good Springs are locked in a cold war, and Ringo's gonna be the deciding factor. 
you can't complete Ghost Town Gunfight and run Good Springs Run in the same playthrough. Ringo lives in one quest and dies in the other. Can't be idolized by Good Springs if Ringo dies. Can't be idolized by the Powder Gangers if he lives. So, that's it. You can't beat Fallout New Vegas while being idolized by everyone. But we can all agree that not every faction is as important as the others. Good Springs, God bless them, they just don't matter. They live isolated lives. Nobody in Good Springs, outside of Victor who splits the second you wake up, matters in any quest outside of the quests I've already mentioned. The Powder Gangers are involved with the NCR. Siding with them gets me more benefits than siding with Good Springs. To be as shallow and pedantic about this as possible, I used the dynamite method to dispose of Ringo and lined up Joe Cobb and his boys for my home run swing. By talking to Cobb and telling him I'd shake down the townsfolk for supplies in the upcoming war for Good Springs, but killing Cobb and his family before beginning the shakedown, the quest has nowhere to go. You can hit the skill check over and over again. Each time, it rewards you with 30 XP, 39mm ammo, a suit of leather armor, and Powder Ganger fame, making them the first group I became idolized by. I spammed the enter button for a long time. I didn't have an exact level in mind to stop at. I just went on and on until I felt I had high enough skills to conquer the wasteland. Speech at 100 lets me talk my way out of a dry paper bag, and all my other skills being above 50 ensures there are only a handful of skill checks throughout New Vegas I cannot pass. And with that, at level 30 f***ing 2, I left town to begin my quest of making 9 other factions worship me. Pretty much every faction's major quest line will have to be completed at some point in the future. The order isn't too important. I went south, towards Mojave Outpost to aid the NCR. Ranger Ghost and Ranger Jackson have two easy quests to complete. Murder a family of insects for Jackson, and check in on Nipton for Ghost and you've got yourself 6 out of 80 points needed for the NCR. While I was in Nipton, I played with Vulpus. He's one of Caesar's most trusted allies, a future quest giver, and a furry. Surely killing him will not come back to bite me in the ass. It can't. My explosives weren't powerful enough to do anything but kill his backup helmets, and I lacked the dynamite reserves to throw a bunch of attempts at him. I continued on to Novak. They're among the easiest to please of all the factions. A measly 15 points will make one idolized. The large quest with the Uggos in the rocket factory are the big ticket item. Nobody in town cares about Boone's wife. Having Genie May shot doesn't do anything to your reputation. Solving a mystery for Dusty McBride can award the few other necessary points. He's a cattle rancher farming Brahmin, and sometimes, in the night, at around midnight, he hears one of his Brahmin cry out in pain as one of them are dragged away into the darkness. I sat in the pen to ambush the thief. Another Brahmin died in the skirmish as I surprised the Nightkin. There's four points for what I did, a possible two more for redoing it and keeping all the cows alive. F it, four is enough. All Manny wants for 12 points is for the ghouls in Repcon to be cleared out. How I do that doesn't matter. I sent them to the great beyond, and it wasn't enough. 12 plus 4 is not 16. Where did I go wrong? It might have been Jason Bright. One rocket thruster, and one set of pipes primed for landing later. I sent Mr. Bright and his boys towards the stars, became idolized by the town of vacancies, and headed to Red Rock Canyon to make love to the great cons. They're the first major faction we've encountered, requiring 30 points to fully please, but it's not too bad. Deliver a couple special packages to a guy in the Crimson Caravan and a gangster down in Vault 3, teach Jack all about how to optimize his drugs and refuse payment because knowledge is a disease best spread with love. And with that, they're already quite fond of me. For idolation, I'd have to convince Papa Khan, the King Khan, to take his ball and go home. This is their home, and he needs to leave. Talking Papa into killing his tribe takes some effort mostly from reaching Melissa and showing her the light. Khans are strong believers in Caesar's Legion, but the Legion doesn't believe in women. Women are in the Khans. You can see the disconnect. Getting Melissa to back me up when I spit in Papa Khan's face will go a long way towards keeping my face attached to my skull. She's out by Sloan, up the road a ways, around the bend, neck deep in hell. Back beyond the Death Claws is where she got herself trapped. She always said she wanted to be a crane. I just thought she had something different in mind. The Death Claws died, it's in their name. I let Melissa know what would happen to her if she didn't do exactly as I said, and I let Papa in on the truth. He wouldn't stand for deceit in his house. He turned off Carl right then and there, vowed to take the cons from the wasteland. I became their idol and went north to the Boomers. The Boomers are a joke. They require 50 fame to be idolized by. Sounds like a lot of work. Let's find out. Pearl is a Boomer. Be nice to her, offer to work for free, and she'll be nice back. It's just that easy. 
With high skills, a bunch of fame can be gained without leaving the camp or harming a soul. Listen in to the little boomer in training reciting his propaganda, amuse him with various facts about the history of his people, and you're at 8 points. The nearby medicine hut has 3 soldiers inside, 2 soldiers appear to be wounded, and a third soldier is wounded as well. Perform some red rock voodoo magic on a bunch of them for 21 more points. Then, you hand over all your scrap metal to Jack to blast into the land of idols. Some factions, including the boomers, have someone who will take donations and give items and usually fame in return. It's easy to abuse, I'll make a joke about this later. For now, I'm working with the Brotherhood of Steel. You think you know what's coming with them. You probably have a general idea, seeing as I can't blow up their bunker. Whatever you're conjuring up inside that head of yours is wrong. The only way to become idolized with the Brotherhood of Steel is to complete the last quest in Lonesome Road, including all the side nonsense like rescuing dead bodies and purging viruses from their database, you max out at liked. I could have jumped straight to Lonesome Road, gotten fame for the Brotherhood, and then came back to interact with the mole people as little as possible. I didn't do that because many quests in New Vegas are intertwined. Scribe Lorenzo sends you out on a mission to search the vaults of the Mojave for parts for their air compressor. This is where my predeterministic abilities come into play. I thought ahead. I did my due diligence and had a general plan. By going to Camp McCarran before entering Vault 22, I can kill two birds and seriously injure a third with one stone. Dr. Hildren at Camp McCarran wants info on Vault 22's plant infestation. One of the pieces the Brotherhood needs is down there, and Vault suits can be found down there. I've told you all about quests and helping people, but what I haven't told you about is how you can use donations and the act of charity to scam people out of their emotions. Sarah runs the Vault 21 gift shop on the Strip. You can donate Vault suits to her store, and in return, she'll give you fame for the Strip. Check your notes. The required fame for the Strip is 40. New Vegas has 5 vaults. Gather suits from each for easy fame, plus a few quests here and there, and we're well on our way towards literally having my name up in lights. That'll be a great day for all of us. After successfully saving Vault 22 and reporting back to Hildern, I let the Brotherhood simmer and did a large mission for the NCR. Return to Sender. Go to six different NCR ranger stations to upgrade their radios. Tell someone, then go back out to three more to check on animal attacks they've recently gone through. Why not use the new radios to ask? Why not ask when I was there at each camp initially? Because this is busy work, mostly. Obsidian only had 18 hours to make New Vegas. It's amazing they accomplished what they did. It turns out, those attacks on ranger stations were a load of fiction. Chief Hanlon had been falsifying reports for weeks to get supplies for his camp. Those supplies could have gone to a better place. That won't stand. I ran to tattle on him. In the time it took me to find another ranger, he locked the door and put a tunnel in between his ears. I promised his corpse that I'd look after his gun until the end of time, gained some NCR fame for that suicide, funny how that worked itself out, and set off down the lonesome road. So, uh, spoilers kinda, nothing here matters. I'm level 45, I'm gonna skip almost everything from this DLC. See, I'm already at Ulysses Temple and max level. Being the max level with multiple perks maxed out, having NCR fame and Legion fame let me pick the right set of options to force Ulysses to abandon his plan to nuke both factions. In trying to reach the temple, I started using the ammo exploit to create the wind button with red glare and tens of thousands of 9mm rockets. I sacrificed Eddie for fortune and fame just as I said I would, fled the divide, became idolized by the Brotherhood, my fame with the followers of the apocalypse went up as well. I repaired Helios 1, split the power between the Strip and Camp McCarran, and searched around Camp Light for something to do. In addition to the main objective of being idolized by as many factions as possible when the game ends, I'd also like to be idolized by everyone before I get the platinum chip, just to see if there would be any changes. What happens if you meet Caesar after you're idolized by the Legion? I say that now because Captain Astor at Searchlight wanted me to get revenge on the Legion for what they'd done to Searchlight by wiping out Cottonwood Cove. All of it. He's insane. I'll come back for Camp Searchlight later. For the time being, I handed over all my Radax, Radaway, and Fixer to Julie Farkas in the World of Mormons. The followers are another faction who you don't necessarily have to do any work for. It's 50 points to be their idol, and 39 of those points can be gained by donating drugs to Farkas. She needs 9 doses of each happy substances for 33 points, 6 more points comes from pushing more drugs onto her, she doesn't get to stop now. I, however, did stop when I ran out of drugs to give her. Enraged, I turned to the Legion for support. At Cottonwood Cove, I found the big wig and turned all my NCR dog tags into hooked on phonics for Legion fame. These fake Italians are the sole members of the Centurion Club. They're the only factions who need 100 fame to be idolized. 
including murdering Caesar, there are like five things to do with the Legion. This is fine. No, it's not. I've danced around this topic for long enough. The pool doesn't look very deep, but I'm gonna dive in headfirst anyway. The Legion take NCR dog tags in exchange for fame. There are other factions like this, like I've already mentioned, and they include the Boomers, who accept scrap metal as you've already seen. The Powder Gangers have that Good Springs exploit for free fame. Freeside can be bought for a couple thousand caps, and donating vault suits to Sarah gives fame for the strip. The remaining factions have no easy way forward. It's nothing but the straight and narrow from here on out. Starting with the bug sneaking into the tower every Tuesday night, and ending with the monorail exploding because I failed to stop the explosion. No harm done. Nobody's gonna be thinking about the train today. Later that afternoon, after the train died, I started taking out as many NCR soldiers as I could find. Sneak attacks negate any negative faction effects that come from outright murder. My sneak is at 100. I've got a silenced tan gun and a stealth boy. See what I'm getting at? Everything I do in this game is trivial now. Out drinking a washed up caravan worker? Easy. It's the small things that trip me up now, like going to the gun runners and accidentally flying into orbit. I gained more NCR fame after stripping the money factory for its parts and more Legion fame by dropping off about two dozen more dog tags taking me to liked by the Legion. I rambled around some more, using my god-tier skills to kill just about every NCR trooper I found. I bought the medical supplies from the doctors in my way, stim packs to stuff in my bullet holes, and chems for the freeside doctor. My rampage against the NCR continued to make big waves in their population pool. After the strip attack and the monorail attack I let happen and Camp McCarran, I returned to Cass's home turf to kill one soldier for every whiskey she drank in her life. Then I took her with me to show the almost legate what I did. I'd become idolized by the Legion, taking my idol count up to the Boomers, Brotherhood of Steel, Caesar's Legion, Freeside, Great Cons, Novak, Powder Gangers. We're getting close now. The strip's close. She's teetering on the edge. She just needs a little push to send those heels to the ceiling. I'm not the man for this. I just took pictures out in the pasture where the last woman to truly get me lost her life. The pictures were for the town agrophobe, Michael Angelo. He's trying to bring style and grace back to the strip. It's not much in the way of points, but it's honest work and it helps out a loser. Speaking of losers, I searched Sarah's vault for more suits to donate. None were found down there, which was great for me. I did plan B first. I came into the store with 19 vault suits. To ensure I got the most points possible, it can be finicky with these mass donations, I dropped the suits on the floor and handed them to her one at a time. The suits were not enough. But there is another faction I haven't met yet, and oddly enough, they require the fewest points of any factions. They are the White Glove Society. Gloves because of the digits on your hand. 10 points for the White Gloves and you are idolized. How this is accomplished is entirely up to the player. You will do the Beyond the Beef quest and you will like it. Outside of opening fire on them or other petty crimes, doing that quest is the only way to change your reputation with the White Glove Society. Kinda shit, kinda not. Beyond the Beef is beyond annoying to complete. It doesn't come with a full serving of humor. You can't see the dislike button anymore. I'm free to use a higher level of humor than you're used to. Completing Beyond the Beef is one thing, but finishing it with the outcome of maximum White Glove fame and strip fame in mind makes it far more convoluted. To write the history book for this story, I sweet-talked Morty to get access to the basement, where I used vats to scan the sauna for naked NCR troops I could assassinate for their dog tags. Since the beginning, I haven't hit the sneak indicator on screen. Not by choice, I just didn't feel like disabling individual mods to see which was causing it because I could and did work around it. That problem, like all festering problems you ignore, extended to pretty much anything involving the E key late in the game. So like you walk up to an NPC and their name to talk to them doesn't show up. Immersive, neat, just not a great feature for this run. Down in the basement, I used my knowledge of the human noodle to talk the chef into taking a mental health break. While he was off weeping, I used my wasteland survival skills to fake a meal that tasted like human flesh, let the head chef take it away, and waited in the shadows for Mortimer to go on an exuberant rant to all of his fellow gloves about a return to form. They're eating Ted Gunderson, son of Heck Gunderson. Who the heck is Heck Gunderson, you're right to be asking? He's the meat supplier of the largest meat supplier in the Mojave. Therein lies the trick. Keeping the white gloves happy, getting Ted out alive, and convincing Heck to continue supplying to meat to the casinos and the strip. As Mortimer brags to everyone about consuming what tastes like Ted Gunderson, I bring out the real Ted, reveal the real truth. The audience gasps as Mortimer flees. I didn't so much as go after him as much as I did follow him towards the entrance where Ted's father is. Now idolized by the white gloves, the only remaining factions are the strip and NCR, both of whom like me. I had a few vault suits to give to Sarah for some last minute fame, 
and out of stubbornness, I turned to Cottonwood Cove to boost my NCR fame. I pulled out greased lightning, crouched down, and force-fed a couple knuckle sandwiches to the Legion without anyone hearing it. I relied on quick saves and luck to sneak attack them all. No way to know if they'll detect me until I attack. I managed to wipe them all out without raising the alarm, including the guy I sold my NCR souls to for fame. It did not matter. For the slaughter of Cottonwood Cove, I became idolized by the New California Republic, and with four points for the strip guaranteed by meeting Mr. House and leaving the Lucky 38, I saw no reason to not take the easy way out and confront the big man in the tower. I hadn't the chip yet, all there was to do there was increase my payment. I didn't have the chip, no fame, what a shame. I went back on my primary objective and ran for the tops, met Yes Man, Swank gave me my guns back and I approached Benny. His guards knew their place and didn't say a word. Benny, of course, ran his mouth. I went up to his special place and blew him apart with the most powerful gun I had to my name. With the platinum chip in my possession, all my transgressions against the Legion had been forgiven. They love me. There's nothing for them to forgive. I went to the fort and introduced myself to Caesar. His reaction wasn't what I was expecting. Apparently, I'd been a pain in his ass since I regained consciousness. Despite the conflicting information, most of the experts agree that most of the evidence points towards him being wrong. Upgrading the robots in the underground bunker pleased Caesar. The big idiot thought the rumble was destruction. It was the opposite. Sounds of construction as I upgraded the Securitron army for Mr. House. Caesar gave me his trip back, House showed me his entire hand, I didn't believe him, so I took a look for myself. Blowing him up with dynamite only gives negative karma, there's no reputation loss for his demise. Now that he's out of the way, the NCR started making their moves. They wiped out my negative record just as Caesar did, and I took very careful steps towards the end of the game. I've met all the factions, done quests for them all, and become about as loved as I can. From here on out, it's all about maintaining a balance between all factions. I'm about as coordinated as a drunk swan on a teeter-totter. My balancing act may be unorthodox to some. I didn't want to take the Yes Man way out. I chose the NCR as my playthings. Things that go boom is my quest, it's a pun, it's the sound their hips make when they fall down the stairs. I've already done their job. Kings are next. My reputation with Freeside supersedes it but it doesn't afford me any special treatment. Not fair. I paid good money for that reputation. In retaliation, I spiked Pacer's pillow with Psyker for Ambassador Crocker. For the Republic Part 2 took me to Hoover Dam to see Cass's mother. Her job for me was erasing the Great Cons. Been there, done that, Caesar just now caught wind of what I'd done to his puppets. Turning in that quest knocked my Legion reputation down from idolized to good-natured rascal. Siding with the NCR isn't an option. My choices have narrowed. I'd been friendly with the Fiends in Vault 3 up until now. Theirs is the last vault I haven't pillaged for vault suits. Anders was there too, was being the biggest word in that sentence, thematically. Anders tripped down the stairs and died. I didn't find any more vault suits. No way around it now. I sided with Yes Man. House is MIA. I familiarized myself with all the players on the side of the field. That quest is complete. Bet you didn't know Caesar has ears everywhere. Working against him gave me a few negative reputation points, lowering my status with them once again to good-natured rascal. In another life, I tried to side with Mr. House. Upon getting my orders to investigate Gamora for any funny business, my reputation with the Legion dropped. Let me run you through the end game real quick. There's meeting the factions, I did that, President Kimball's address, the El Dorado substation, and Hoover Dam. You can't get through the meeting the factions portion of New Vegas without receiving some infamy with some group, probably the Legion. Back in real life, I kept on siding with Yes Man, ate the Legion infamy like a good little boy, and headed into Gamora looking for a laugh. Gacino, after being swayed by my persuasion tactics of breaking into his room, reading his diary and blackmailing him with it, told me about his boss's plans to fuck up the strip when war breaks out. I blew up their guns and tricked the bosses into opening fire with each other becoming idolized by the strip in the process. Next, I went back to Hoover Dam and did a quick sweep of the area to prepare for President Kimball's arrival. The son of a senator stubbed his toe, the president's coming to give him a medal. I almost caught the repairman running away from the bird the big cheese rode in on. What I could do that I usually couldn't is derig the explosive device to prevent it from exploding, which would happen not too long after the Legion sniper tried to take him out from the tower and the maniac rushed him with a knife. The president was safe and sound. I didn't get any fame, but I didn't lose any either. The finishing touches here, El Dorado substation. What a f nightmare. NCR soldiers stationed there, maybe five of them, guarding that outpost like God himself commanded them to, but I didn't remember giving them any orders. I sneak attacked one, ran around the back for another, missed, waited until night, and the trouble began. 
They're inside the station, and going inside antagonizes them. You want to do a hated by everyone run, come here for the NCR. Stand inside and you'll be vilified in under 30 seconds. The trouble was them being inside. They would not come out no matter what I tried. I waited for them there. I used the wait feature to pass the days. I waited at Hidden Bunker, I waited at Good Springs, and there I remembered the stealth boy in the safe sunny smile told me about after I was born. I took my clothes off, popped the stealth boy, snuck through the station as quickly as I could, and left before they knew what hit them and what hit my reputation. It wasn't what I expected. Caesar's Legion thinks I'm a wild child, and the NCR idolizes me. Good news? I didn't trespass long enough to change my reputation status with the NCR. Bad news? The Legion. That happened after winning a side bet with Yes Man. We're at the end now. The second battle of Hoover Dam. Let's see where we stand. Boomers. Brotherhood of Steel. Followers of the Apocalypse. Freeside. Great Cons. NCR. Novak. Powder Gangers. The Strip. And the White Glove Society all idolize me. Good Springs sees me for who I really am, and the Legion sees me as a wild child. I'm an extremist. Wild child comes from both 100 fam and 100 infamy. The best of both worlds, really. I didn't check, but I'm almost positive that doing anything other than siding with the Legion will get you 100 infamy with the Legion. After all that work to get here, it's surprisingly easy in the home stretch. Although I did have to go back and ditch Cass. She opened fire on the Legion, and I wasn't looking for any more negativity than I already had. They attacked me. That didn't change. This was for me. I ran past the heavy troopers, installed Yes Man, exploded the generators, and made it back up top where the boomers rained down pretend bombs from above. You already know I talked my way out of the Legate fight. I changed things up by using barter instead of speech. Oliver arrived. I talked him down too, and did not beat Fallout New Vegas while being idolized by everyone. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for making videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord by going to mitten.land. Follow me on Twitter, at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.